Hello everyone. Welcome to the Operationalizing Microsoft Workload session. We are glad to have you here with us. My name is Pallavi Sharma. I am a product manager on EC2, focusing on Microsoft and other enterprise workloads. And my name is Siavesh Irani, a solutions architect here at AWS, helping customers with their Microsoft workloads. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Pallavi to cover what we are going to show you today. Thank you, Siavesh. We are going to be covering a few topics throughout this presentation. We also have a few demos prepared for you. So let's jump right in. When you think about operationalizing your Microsoft workloads, what comes to mind? For a lot of administrators, that might be things like provisioning infrastructure, building automation to provision your environment on AWS, patch management, remote access to configure your EC2 instances within the cloud, backups, patching, monitoring, determining how your Windows and SQL servers are performing in the cloud. Also, it may include things like compliance as well as resource optimization. In this session, we hope to take you through a phased approach similar to a lifecycle management process of how you can leverage some of the services, tools, and capabilities that we built into our platform to help make your life easier when it comes to managing Microsoft workloads in the cloud. We'll go through the agenda, which is going to include tools and services for infrastructure provisioning to help you automate these tasks, services for configuration management. We'll talk about monitoring and performance, then governance and compliance. And at the end, we'll cover resource optimization and end of life upgrades. First, we want to talk about infrastructure provisioning. Let's take a three-tier web application using Microsoft workloads in AWS. What are the manual steps that it takes to build such an environment? First, you need to create a VPC and different subnets in different availability zones. Then, you need to bring up EC2 instances for your web tier, application tier, and your database tier. In case you are using Microsoft SQL Server, you also need to install SQL Server, add the role, and configure security groups. Also, in case you are using directory services, you can either use managed active directory or simple directory, or maybe you have, a, you have set up a trust back to your local on-premises environment. If you do all of this manually, it is going to take time and it is not repeatable. If I want to build similar environment for different purpose, let's say for my development in another VPC, I cannot assure that the other environment that I'm building is going to be exactly the same. There is always human error involved if I'm doing it manually. And it is also time consuming. Well, all of this can be done using AWS CloudFormation Service. I know many of you are probably familiar with the tool. CloudFormation Service is an infrastructure as a code service where you put all the components that you want to create along with all the configuration in a template file in JSON or YAML format. You can either save it locally or in a S3 bucket. CloudFormation can then go ahead and deploy these components for you. It can be done both for things that are at the AWS layer, like provisioning a VPC, security groups, ACL, and also for things that, that are at the OS level, like configuring Active Directory or IIS role. There are two big advantages of using CloudFormation. First is that it is automated an administrator can just start the CloudFormation stack. It's going to go, read the file, and deploy everything for you. Second is that it is repeatable. So if you want to deploy it in another region for DR or for testing and development, you can use CloudFormation for that. To further simplify building these CloudFormation templates, we created AWS Quick Starts. Quick Starts are reference CloudFormation templates which are built by very experienced AWS solution architects for different technologies, including Microsoft solutions. For example, we have a reference template that builds a complete environment for things like Exchange Server, SharePoint, and other Microsoft technologies. We continuously keep adding to this list. 
you can download these templates and customize them for your own workloads. These can be accessed using the Quick Start URL shown here. For more complex topologies, such as SQL Server Always On, customers have asked us for more options that, that can simplify their deployment process. For example, when you provision SQL Server Always On manually, you have to follow multiple steps and configure multiple services to put it together. First, you determine the right instance type and EBS volume for your performance needs. Then, you check whether this infrastructure meets your organization's budget requirements. Then, you learn cloud best practices and assemble your deployment workflow according to that. Finally, you provision these resources and then configure a whole bunch of settings like Windows Server Failover Cluster, Active Directory, and SQL Server before you can use the database. To make it easy for you to deploy third-party applications such as SQL Server Always On, we announced the AWS Launch Wizard. This service offers you an end-to-end -end guided experience for sizing, configuring, and provisioning SQL Server Always On on EC2. You don't have to identify and provision individual AWS resources. On the console, you simply input your SQL Server requirements, including performance, licensing, number of nodes, etc., and the launch wizard identifies the right AWS resources for your needs. The launch wizard presents you with an estimated cost of deployment. You have the ability to modify the resource configuration and instantly see an updated cost assessment. Once you approve, AWS Launch Wizard provisions and configures these resources to create a fully functioning, production-ready deployment. The Launch Wizard follows the AWS recommended best practices and automates the deployment in fraction of the time of what it would take to do it manually. It also creates custom cloud formation templates that can serve as a baseline to accelerate any subsequent SQL Server deployments you may have. You can use this service with standard and enterprise editions of all current SQL Server versions, including SQL Server 2019. In addition to the general availability for SQL Server, we recently announced a preview for SAP deployments through the Launch Wizard. You can anticipate that we'll continue to add more workloads to the Launch Wizard. If you have suggestions on what we should offer next, do let us know. Now let me show you a demo of how this service works. So you go on the AWS console. Under the Management and Governance section, click on the Launch Wizard. It takes you to the, to the main page for the service. Here you see this diagram that summarizes how this service works. Underneath it lists out the benefits and features and other related services. We click on the Create Deployment to start with our, our deployment process. Here you get an option to choose your application. As I just mentioned, our, the SQL Server deployments are generally available, and SAP deployments have been launched in, in preview, and you're very welcome to sign up. So for this demo, clicking on the SQL Server, we click Next. On this page, we, we come to the permissions or setting up the IAM policies that allow Launch Wizard to access other AWS services on your behalf. Click Next. Now we come to the page where we configure our application settings. We start with giving our deployment a unique name. So let's say SQL. Then, if you want to be notified of the progress of your deployment, you can use the simple notification service. You can either use an existing SNS topic or create a new one from right here. So if you were to create a new SNS topic, it will take you to the SNS service console and you can create one. And if you were to refresh it here, the new SNS will show up in the dropdown. For the demo, I'll pick up, I'll use one of my existing SNS topics. Next, I come to the connectivity section. Here I choose a key pair that lets me securely connect to my SQL Server instance. So I'll pick up uh, an existing key pair. 
Next, I choose my VPC. This lets me provision a logically isolated section of the AWS cloud where I'll install my SQL Server instances. I could either select an existing VPC or create a new one from right within the launch wizard. For the demo, let me select an existing VPC. Now, as you know, SQL Always On uh, needs to have at least two nodes or can have more as well. And each of those nodes are each of those nodes are deployed in a private subnet. And with two private subnets, I need at least one public subnet for outbound connectivity. So within this VPC, I select a public subnet that I have. If I didn't, I could create one new subnet and come back right here without disrupting the flow of my deployment. Next, I select the availability zones where each of my where my private subnets reside. So I, I select US West 2A and US West 2B for the demo. Now, for my outbound connectivity, there has to be a there has to be a connection between public subnet and private subnet. It could be either through VPC peering or through NAT gateway or other mechanisms. Here I have a NAT gateway established, so I select this option. Next, I have the optional setting of of specifying my remote desktop gateway access. I could either use my custom IP or use an existing security group. For the demo, I'll use an existing security group. Next, for Active Directory, we know in uh, for SQL HA deployments, we need to domain join to an Active Directory. So Launch Wizard gives me an option to either connect to an existing Active Directory. Now this could be an existing AWS managed Active Directory or an on-premises Active Directory. In either case, I will provide the username and password for, for connecting to it. For the demo, let me create and connect to a new AWS managed AD. So let me set a password. As you see, we have form field validations built in that helps get rid of human errors. I'll take a demo domain DNS name. Now, if I had connected to an existing AD, I would have had the option to use an uh, existing SQL service account within that AD, but since I'm creating a new AD, I'll create a new SQL Server service account as well. So let me set a username and a password. In this section, I, I pick the Amazon machine image based on which I'll install my SQL Server uh, licenses. So I could either use a license included AMI or I could bring a custom AMI. So if I had any custom AMIs, this dropdown would select automatically detect it from my account and populate the dropdown. The custom AMI option lets me bring a BYOL version or a license included custom AMI. For the demo, I'll pick from a license included AMI. And as you see, all the current SQL Server versions for both Standard and Enterprise Edition are supported. So let me pick the SQL 2019 Enterprise Edition. Below are some optional settings, such as uh, specifying the node names for primary, secondary. Also, if I wanted, I could add additional secondary nodes. But for the demo, let me move past these optional settings and click Next. Now I come to the, to the section where I define my infrastructure requirements. Now here too, you have the option to either let AWS recommend the resources for you. So you could, you could uh, specify your requirements like you would on, on premises, for example, number of cores you need, how much memory, and according to that, the launch wizard recommends the right resources to meet your requirements. Similarly, if you already know what instance type you are looking for, you can just pick, select the choose your instance option and then from this drop down, easily select the right instance for you. For the demo, let me go with the recommendation. Another thing to note is once, we rec once uh, you pick the right resource, uh, we provide you a 
cost estimate to help you pick between different selections. So as you see, it's reflected, it's the change in cost estimate is reflected in real time and that helps you make decision and compare options. So uh, you can also add tags uh, uh, to your different components or the entire deployment. Once you finalize the, the stack to deploy, click Next. Now finally, on the Review and Deploy page, you see the summary of all the infrastructure and settings that are going to be deployed under, for this uh, configuration. You acknowledge and hit Deploy. This starts the deployment process. And since SQL always on deployment and configuration takes a total of one to one to three hours, um, which the SNS would keep you posted about, let me use an existing uh, deployment that I did recently to show you additional options of after deployment. So as you see here, this page shows you all the steps that were taken to complete the deployment. Also, you can revisit the cloud formation templates for each of these steps and use them to programmatically do any future deployments. The summary gives you another view into all the components and settings and infrastructure that was deployed on your behalf. Also, on this snapshot of all your historical de deployments, you could delete an existing deployment through right here and all the all the actions that were taken to deploy will be rolled back. Similarly, after your deployment completes, for your downstream events, such as managing those resources on EC2 console or, um, or patching and other activities on Systems Manager or uh, viewing your CloudWatch, CloudWatch logs, you can directly use the links listed right here from the, uh, from the Launch Wizard console. So with that, I'll hand it off to Siavesh to talk about configuration management. Thank you, Pallavi. We talked about infrastructure provisioning. Pallavi provided a diagram of a three-tier web application. Perhaps you can t keep that application in mind as we go through this process, or maybe think of an application of your own that you'd like to be an managed and operationalized in, in the cloud. Now we're going to talk about configuration management. So, Typically, most customers managed migrate that migrate to, to AWS. Uh, let me start from the beginning. Uh, <clears throat> so typically, most customers that migrate to AWS use some tools that they may be already familiar with to manage their environment. For example, remote PowerShell, MMC, PSXec, Server Manager, or third-party tools to do tasks like resetting admin password, restarting services, group policy updates, configure Windows updates, or uh, VSS snapshots, and so on. We're not going to talk about all of them here. All these tools are fine, and they work great on AWS, but we have gotten feedback from our customers that they wanted more cloud-friendly solution for these workloads, for which we built AWS Systems Manager. Systems Manager has different capabilities, and some can, that can help customers with these tasks are AWS Systems Manager Run Command and AWS Systems Manager Session Manager. So Run Command is good for bulk administrative type, type tasks, like if you want to run a command on a fleet of instances, and it's non-interactive, Session Manager, however, allows you to have a live interactive PowerShell session to your instance. Session Manager also adds a feature to do port forwarding, which basically allows you to redirect traffic from any port inside a remote Amazon EC2 or on-premises instance to a local port on a client machine. For example, think about traditional way of connecting to instances. In this diagram, on the right side, we have a VPC with a private subnet, and you're running an application on EC2 inside this subnet, and you want to make administrative changes to this instance. For that, as best practice, you will probably need to set up a Bastion host, and also you need to open some inbound security ports to access the instance. Now, all of this can be eliminated by using Systems Manager. With Systems Manager, there is no need for Bastion host, and also there is no need for opening security inbound ports to connect to the instances. 
Using Systems Manager, Session Manager, or Run Command, the AWS Administrator uh, can connect to the EC2 instance. All the commands that he, he runs can be sent to CloudWatch logs or S3 for auditing purposes. Also, a notification can be sent using Amazon Simple Notification Service when a command is executed. Even his access can be limited using IAM policies. And another thing that I want to highlight here is using Session Manager, we can port forward the RDP port on the EC2 instance to the administrator local client port and make RDP connection to the instance without opening RDP port on the instance security group. With that, let's get to the demo section. For the demo, what I've done is I've launched two EC2 instances uh, that they are running here, demo one and demo two instance. Now what I'm going to do is from services, I'm going to select systems manager. In this case, let's assume that we want to run a command on those two instances to let's say reset administrator password. Of course, you know, you can uh, run different commands. So from Systems Manager, I chose uh, Run Command. And here I click on uh, Run Command. And here I need to choose my uh, command document. Basically, command document uh, is instructions that tell Systems Manager what you are trying to do. In this case, I'm choosing AWS Run PowerShell script, which allows me to run a, com a PowerShell command on my instance. For this purpose, uh, let's assume that we want to change admin password. So I'm going to do net uh, user administrator. And then um, I'm going to pass a password, a parameter that I've gotten from uh, SSM parameter store, which is another uh, feature within uh, Systems Manager. And then I'm going to uh, I can uh, I'm going to choose uh, what instances I want to run this command on. I can uh, go based on tags, uh, or in this case, I'm going to just choose uh, based on the uh, basically pick the instances manually here. I have the option uh, to send the output of all these commands to S3 or uh, CloudWatch for further uh, auditing purposes. Even I can get a notification in case I want. For now, I'm just going to leave them blank and click on Run. Now, what happens in the back end, the command is sent to systems uh, manager servers. And then also, the agent that's located on the instances are going to pick up that command from systems manager servers and execute it on the instance and return the results back here into, into the systems manager console. So let's take a look at the command that was executed on these instances. You can see that the commands were successfully uh, ran on those. Next thing I want to show you here is using Session Manager. So you, we saw how Run Command can allow us to run multiple, uh, like one command on multiple instances. Now let's go to Session Manager. I've already configured my instances to work with Session Manager. I can click on Start a Session and choose one of these instances that we just uh, reset the password on. Here, notice that I don't need to even uh, uh, re enter any password because I'm already authenticated with AWS Console. Now, this gives me an interactive session to this instance. I can run any PowerShell command that I want. For example, I can do a, a, like a IP config to get my uh, IP address of the server. Or maybe you are doing like a group policy update uh, to do like GP update uh, you know, for such force, or any, any command that you want to run here. And then uh, you can also terminate uh, the session. Uh, one thing is uh, you, you can control this. So different IAM users can have uh, permission to only access certain instances if you configure in, in IAM, which we are not going to cover here. Now I'm going to terminate this session. Next thing that I want to show you is uh, how we can access these instances uh, over RDP with port forwarding feature in Session Manager. I'm going to switch back to EC2 so I can show you that there is no inbound port open for these instances. So let me open EC2. And if I click on uh, Secure Group for these instances, you can see that there is no inbound port open, no inbound traffic. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open Command Prompt and run this AWS CLI, which basically what it does it's going to uh, port forward 
port 3389, which is the RDP port on the target server, to my local la uh, laptop port, which is 338899. And now the connection is established. So I should be able to connect to that instance using this port by connecting to my local host. For that, I'm going to open RDP client and connect to local host, which is my laptop, and 33899. And connect. There you go. Without any inbound ports, I was able to connect to this target server. OK, uh, with that, uh, I'm going to go back to the presentation. So uh, besides interacting with your servers or managing their configurations, uh, there are many other tasks where uh, we are not going to cover all of them uh, in this session. But one task that is very important, especially in Windows workloads, is patching Microsoft workloads. So how do you do that? Well, many customers may use Windows Server Update Services or Windows Update Settings uh, to go uh, to Microsoft and pull down re recent uh, security patches. Or they may have a third-party application that does the patching for them. These are all fine, and it works great on AWS, but we have created some capabilities within, within Systems Manager to help with that as well. The first capability is AWS Systems Manager Patch Manager, and the second one is AWS Systems Manager Maintenance Window. So let's talk about those. So Patch Manager is used to automate the process of patching your managed instances, and it allows you to scan for missing patches, as well as scan and apply missing patches individually or to a large group of instances by using EC2 instance tags. For security patches, Patch Manager uses patch baselines that include rules for auto-approving patches within days of their release, as well as list of approved and rejected patches. Security patches are installed from the default repository for patches that are configured for the instance. Uh, that means if you are using Windows Server Update Services or, and you have that running within AWS, you can still use that uh, as your repository for those patches. You can also install security patches on a regular basis by scheduling your patches to run via AWS Systems Manager maintenance windows. Basically, maintenance windows allows you to set a recurring schedule for your managed instances to execute tasks that may be disruptive to your instances. This task can be AWS Systems Manager run command, automation, uh, AWS Lambda, or step functions. Next, we want to talk about automating IT tasks. Let's think about uh, creating golden images as an example. What are the steps involved in creating golden images? We need to launch it first. We need to launch a new instance from our previous month AMI, update AWS components like drivers, uh, update Windows operating system and applications, and then optionally you may do a sysprep and create an image from the instance. Today, uh, you may use scripting or third-party tools to do these tasks, but all AWS Systems Manager Automation can also help with this. AWS Systems Manager Automation was built to simplify common IT tasks with uh, uh, common IT tasks. With uh, uh, yeah. take that one the top. AWS Systems Manager Automation was built to simplify common IT tasks. With automation, you can express your workflow in JSON or YAML-based documents, and it supports different tasks ranging from Systems Manager run command to Lambda functions and AWS API calls. Next, I'm going to talk about monitoring and performance management of Microsoft workloads in AWS. Keeping your business critical applications up and running is number one priority in order to provide a reliable service to customers and maintain SLAs. You need visibility into how your applications are utilizing various resources so that you can identify performance bottlenecks before they impact your customers. You can use Amazon CloudWatch service to monitor these type of resources. With Amazon CloudWatch service, there is no need to set up monitoring servers, and CloudWatch allows you to monitor resources that are available to the hypervisor, like CPU usage, disk I.O. usage, server health checks, but also it allows you to monitor in-guest metrics, like memory usage, 
specific kernel metrics or application specific metrics like SQL performance metrics or .NET metrics. Basically, it supports for all Windows performance counter metrics. Not only we need to monitor resources, but also another important thing to monitor is logs. These logs can be IS logs, Windows event logs, SQL logs, cluster logs, third-party application logs, or any other log type that you can think of. You can store all your logs from everywhere, even our, from your on-premise servers to Amazon CloudWatch service and monitor them. You can use Amazon CloudWatch logs to monitor applications and systems using log data in real time. For example, CloudWatch logs can track the number of errors that occur in your application logs and send you a notification whenever the rate of errors exceeds a threshold you specify. By default, logs are kept indefinitely and never expire. You can adjust the retention policy for each log group, either keeping the indefinite uh, retention or choosing a retention period between one day and 10 years. CloudWatch Logs stores your log data in a highly durable storage, which can be accessed at any time. So the question is, how can you send logs or performance metrics to Amazon CloudWatch service? One option is CloudWatch Agent, which is a Windows service that gets installed on Windows, and then based on the configuration file, it can send logs, Windows events, or performance metrics to CloudWatch service. Another option is to use Amazon Kinesis Agent for Microsoft Windows. Amazon Kinesis Agent for Microsoft Windows is a configurable and extensible agent. It runs on fleets of Windows desktop computers and servers, either on-premises or in the cloud. And Kinesis Agent for Windows efficiently and reliably gathers, parses, transforms, and streams logs, events, and metrics to various AWS services like Kinesis Data Streams, Kinesis Data Firehose, Amazon CloudWatch, and Amazon CloudWatch Logs. Well, OK, let's say uh, we uploaded the logs to CloudWatch Logs. Now, how can we search them? How can we analyze them? In this, in this diagram, I have three-tier web application and some on-premises servers, which are configured to send their metrics and logs to Amazon CloudWatch Logs. Although there are many different tools that allows you to analyze logs in CloudWatch Logs, I want to highlight CloudWatch Logs Insight, which is a feature that allows you to do interactive search across logs, supports multiple queries like regex, it's real time, and it's also able to automatically discover fields from different log types. With that, let me show you an example of using CloudWatch Logs Insight in the demo section. So for the demo, what I've done, the same two servers that we looked at before, I've configured them to send their Windows security event logs to Amazon CloudWatch Log Service. If I go to, uh, to Services and open CloudWatch Service Console and click on uh, CloudWatch Logs from the left side, you can see that uh, this log group that was created uh, as part of the log uploads that's being done uh, uh, using, in this case, I used a unified CloudWatch agent. And uh, if I go here, I can see all type of uh, security logs that has been uploaded. But now I want to click on uh, Logs Insight. This uh, utility gives me an um, opportunity to look into these different logs and look for a specific log uh, event and um, basically uh, analyze them. So I'm going to choose Windows Security Log Group here. and uh, let's assume a scenario where uh, you want to see, uh, let's say you have a fleet of Windows servers, and uh, this can be on-premise, uh, in the cloud, uh, and all these logs are being sent to CloudWatch logs. Now, uh, suddenly someone tells you, hey, who were the users which logged into this fleet of Windows servers over the last hour or over the last three hours? With CloudWatch logs, uh, we can easily query for that. And even we can query to see what process that user ran uh, or used to log into these servers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, copy this query uh, to uh, CloudWatch uh, Logs Insight. And when I run this, it shows me all the previous logs in, logons to my uh, servers. And even I can filter down by a specific time frame. 
using this little cursor here. And it shows me users, it shows me logon type and process name. Now, let's say you want to filter uh, and not include system users, because uh, you may see a lot of those in the system account. I can easily come here and add a filter so it, uh, based on regex to, include, uh, to exclude uh, users that are uh, system uh, from the query. So uh, with that, I'm going to go back uh, to the presentation. Next, I'm going to talk about Amazon CloudWatch application insights for .NET and SQL Server. The way the product started was customers told us that troubleshooting tiered applications are difficult because they have to look through the logs and metrics for different tiers of application and try to correlate between the logs and metrics to find the root cause of an issue and usually because of too much noise in the logs, this process is time consuming and cumbersome. CloudWatch Application Insights for .NET and SQL simplifies these tasks by detecting anomalies using machine learning. It can also visualize the root cause in Amazon CloudWatch dashboards and improve customer experience by significantly reducing the time to resolution. Next, we are going to talk about governance and compliance. Every organization has certain baseline and rules that they want to make sure that their environment is compatible with them. Before doing that, you need to keep an inventory of all different components of your environment. By keeping inventory, we mean we need to have a list of all OS versions and their patch levels, software installations, application configurations, licenses, and so on. Remember, we cannot print this list because the moment we print it, it's out of date. So keeping inventory should be a dynamic and ongoing task. AWS Systems Manager Inventory Service can help us with all of these tasks. Next, let's talk about managing configuration drift. Configuration drift happens when a system drift, drifts from its intended configuration. Some of the example configuration can, that can be drifted are like disabling RDP access, ensuring firewall rules are enabled, enforcing application settings, and so on. Possible reasons that drift can occur include system updates, code pushes, hardware upgrades, or software updates, or even end user accidentally modify settings. You can use AWS Systems Manager State Manager to prevent configuration drift. Basically, you can define a specific configuration, and AWS Systems Manager State Manager can ch check your EC2 instances against the desired configuration based on a schedule. It also supports both on-demand and on-premises instances. Basically, you can define a specific configuration and AWS Systems Manager State Manager can check your EC2 instances against the desired configuration based on a schedule. It also supports both on-premises and EC2 servers. Next, we want to talk about AWS Config, which allows you to discover configuration changes across different AWS resources. With AWS Config, you can continuously audit and monitor your environment for compliance and analyze it for security uh, and other uh, reasons. Uh, AWS Config allows, also allows you to remediate non-compliance items using AWS Systems Manager automation. AWS Config can work with AWS Systems Manager inventory and show you compliance status for items that have been inventoried. In this example, assume that we have EC2 instances and some on-premises servers which are configured with AWS Systems Manager inventory. I can enable AWS Config recording for AWS Systems Manager inventory, and then based on config rules, we can discover items that are non-compliant. The results and history of the item compliance can be viewed in AWS Config Console, and then based on the result, it can send notification using Amazon Simple Notification Service and save the results in Amazon S3 or CloudWatch logs for further analysis. After the non-compliance items are detected, we need to remediate them. AWS Config can automatically call an AWS Systems Manager automation document to execute against the non-compliant items and mitigate the issue. With that, let's take a look at the demo section and see how we can use AWS Config to blacklist an application. So for the demo, uh, I'm going to open AWS uh, Systems Manager first. What I've done here, I've configured uh, my instances to be inventoried. And this is really a simple click 
uh, and what it does, uh, basically, uh, it allows the uh, systems manager uh, from all of my instances to send application information, OS versions, uh, different roles that might be installed on, this, uh, on the servers to uh, AWS Systems Manager inventory. And also, what I've done is I've configured the instance, uh, the config recording. So uh, if we go here under AWS config recording, uh, you can see that it's already been enabled on my account um, and uh, to, to record all the configuration and send it to AWS config. Next thing that I've done is uh, I've created a, a rule uh, to blacklist my application, uh, any application that has uh, the name Java 8 update to 11, and that's just an example. And uh, I've already also installed uh, the Java on these two instances, uh, so they show as non-compliant here. What I can do here is I can choose these instances and um, remedi remediate it. Now, what did I uh, choose for my remediated remediation action is actually I choose this Amazon uh, Systems Manager Automation Stop EC2 instance. So in case any application has that Java, uh, any of my instances has that Java application running, it can go ahead and, and stop the instance. So, uh, and even I can make this automated. So for that, uh, I'm going to just click on uh, one of these instances and click on remediate. So now what's going to happen, uh, let's choose this instance ID so we can look it up in the EC2 console. It should automatically send a command to stop this EC2 because the item is non-compliant. And you can see the instance is already being stopped. Uh, AWS config can be used for many different uh, AWS resources and not only EC2, which I recommend to look for them. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Pallavi for covering the rest, rest of the lifecycle management process. Thanks, Yavish. Now let's talk about managing licenses. With AWS License Manager, customers can easily bring existing licenses to AWS, remain compliant, and benefit from existing investments in enterprise agreements. License Manager is a one-stop solution for managing licenses from a variety of software vendors, such as Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, SAP, and others. License Manager simplifies li software license management for hybrid environments across AWS and on-premises. With License Manager, you get the flexibility and control to track and measure compliant license usage and to proactively prevent overage and non-compliant license usage. You can set up License Manager based on your organizational structure and processes. AWS License Manager provides built-in integration with multiple AWS services to make license management easier. License Manager makes it easier to manage Windows and SQL Server licenses. With License Manager, you get started by defining rules for Windows and SQL Server BYOL based on your enterprise agreements. Use vCPU or physical core-based licensing to maximize your licensing benefits. You can restrict tenancy type to dedicated hosts with License Manager. Set up usage limits to control overages. Keep an eye on licenses allocated with License Manager's dashboard, see whether or not limits are enforced. Manage variety of licenses using License Manager and stay compliant based on your licensing terms across AWS and on-premises. Let's discuss end of support compliance. In your mic if your Microsoft workloads are approaching end of support like SQL Server 2008 or Windows Server 2008, you can use the in-place upgrade tool provided by AWS to upgrade your SQL Server or Windows Server to supported versions. This capability lets you easily upgrade your application using the Systems Manager script. It is fully automated and non-disruptive. With side-by-side -side deployments on existing and new versions, you can validate your application without disturbing your production environment. The last phase in the lifecycle management process is resource optimization. How would you fine-tune your Microsoft workloads in the cloud? 
you want to optimize your workload for performance, storage, and cost while maintaining the right security posture and fault tolerance. Also, you want to be aware of any potential service limits that you may be hitting on AWS. Trusted Advisor helps you with all of these. Trusted Advisor does all these tasks by running checks in different categories. For security checks, it can tell you if your account does not have multi-factor authentication enabled. It alerts you if your S3 bucket has open permissions to the world. You also receive notifications about any security groups that may be open to everyone. For AWS service limits, it can tell you if you are reaching a specific instance type limit in your account, so you can request for limit increase. For cost optimization, Trusted Advisor can notify you if an instance is underutilized, so you can change the instance type to a smaller size to reduce costs. For fault tolerance, AWS Trusted Advisor can tell you the age of your EBS snapshots, so you can renew your EBS snapshots. For performance, Trusted Advisor can tell you if you have overutilized EC2 instances, so you can take action to improve performance. Of course, these are just example checks in each category. And there are many more that Trusted Advisor offers. Code checks and recommendations, which include security and AWS service limits, are available to all AWS customers. And full Trusted Advisor checks are available to business and enterprise support plan customers. We recommend that for production workloads to have at least business support plan. Another optimization practice that you could implement for your Microsoft workloads is to eliminate the OS license costs for your SQL Server workloads by moving them from Windows to Linux. To achieve this, AWS provides you a SQL Server replatforming assistant, which is based on Systems Manager scripts. You can use it on your SQL Server workloads running on-premises or on EC2. This tool lets you easily bring your SQL Server workloads from Windows to Linux and eliminate Windows license usage and fees. To summarize what we discussed, we covered how to use AWS CloudFormation to provision resources and how to use AWS Launch Wizard to build a SQL Server always-on deployment. Under Configuration Management, we discussed how you can use different system manager capabilities like session manager, run command, patch manager, automation, and maintenance windows to manage your environment. For monitoring and performance, we talked about how to monitor your resources using CloudWatch and CloudWatch logs. Also, we covered how you can use CloudWatch log insights to query and analyze CloudWatch logs in real time, and also how CloudWatch application insights for .NET and SQL Server simplifies troubleshooting of tiered applications using machine learning. Under governance and compliance, we talked about preventing configuration drift using Systems Manager, State Manager, and also we showed how you can maintain compliance by integrating AWS Systems Manager, Inventory, and AWS Config. Also, we showed how License Manager can assure you stay compliant for different license agreements, and how you can automatically upgrade your end-of-support Microsoft workloads using Systems Manager. Lastly, we covered how Trusted Advisor can help you by providing recommendations for optimizing your environment from different angles. We also covered how you can use Systems Manager to replatform your SQL databases from Windows to Linux to reduce costs. As next steps, we encourage you to revisit your lifecycle management process and see if there are areas where you can leverage our services to help you reinvent it. If you have any questions, reach out to your AWS account team or the AWS webpage and fill out the form and someone will reach out to you. We also have a large community of partners that have AWS knowledge and Microsoft on AWS certifications that can help as well. I'd like to thank Siavesh for delivering this session with me. My name is Pallavi Sharma. 
I want to thank you for watching this session and here is our contact information.